Welcome everybody to this online masterclass, which will be provided by Mr. Uh, David Dingley, Senior Lecturer at MSM. Uh, before we get started, I would just like to share a few uh, general remarks. Um, if you have a question, uh, please make use of the Q&A functionality. Uh, in most cases, you will find this Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Mr. David Dingley will try to answer all of your questions at the end of the online masterclass class during the live uh, Q&A session. Um, furthermore, this online masterclass will be recorded and we will share the recording and the presentation slides with you in a few days. Um, well, actually, that was it already from my side. Um, I would like to hand over now to uh, Mr. David Dingley. Thank you very much and welcome everybody to this first masterclass that MSM is organizing for the year 2024. So it's good afternoon to those of you in Europe, maybe good morning if you're in the Americas and maybe good evening if you're on the Asian side. I'm not gonna tell you good night if it's really late for you because I don't want you falling asleep halfway through, through the session. We're going to be discussing the concept of a business plan. And the idea in the short time we have together is to try and cover well, what should be in a business plan, especially if we are trying to get an investor maybe, or if we want to apply for a grant, or if we want to apply for a loan. But also a business plan is very important for your own sake to understand the direction your business is taking. A very quick introduction about myself. I do have an electrical engineering background. I've worked in manufacturing, mainly doing industrial engineering, but I've been working with the Maastricht School of Management for the past 24 years, lectured in 30 countries, also working as a management consultant. And in that respect, I have actually written business plans for a number of my, my clients for the reasons that I mentioned earlier before. I'm also a managing partner of an education consulting practice, and I do tend to chair a judging panel for the Entrepreneur of the Year Awards in Malta, which is my country of origin and residence. And I have authored a book called The 20 Faces of Services. So let's get down to what we're going to cover in the masterclass today. The rationale, as in the why do we want to have a business plan? Do you even have a good business idea in the first place? What is the industry? How is it structured? And the competitive environment within which you operate? And then what I call the sub plans. What is the essence within your business plan? I always say, although I personally come from an operations background, but I would always say the marketing plan is primary because you cannot have a business without customers. And marketing is obviously the aim, the arm that is going to reach out to find and attract customers. There is the operations and technology plan. They could be separate. They could be done together depending on the elaboration of the technology that is being undertaken within the business you are developing. We still need people in organizations, so we want a human resource plan. Very important, obviously, the financial plan. What revenues are we gonna make? What costs do we incur? What's left in our pocket? What's the profit of the organization going to be? Key risks and assumptions that we are making within the plan itself. Obviously, we can't know everything about the future. So certain element of risk and uncertainty is always going to be present in any business plan. Now, sometimes people ask me, what's the difference between a business plan and a strategic plan? Well, the business plan is kind of outlining how you're going to achieve your strategic goals, your strategic objectives. The objectives might be the destination you want to reach. Maybe you have an ambition where you want to be as a business within three to five years time. Well, then the question is, 
How do I get there? What road do I take? And that is the way that, of course, you can get there through the business plan. We also know, and there's enough research to show this, that strategic planning, so when we put our thoughts down in terms of a plan, has a strong correlation to better financial performance. It's not a guarantee, but it's definitely going to assist you to take the right decisions. So that's the direction your company is taking. You are at least establishing it. This is the part we are on with very clear goals because you cannot write a plan without a destination that you want to reach. And these, of course, take the shape of the long-term objectives of the organization. We need to determine how we're going to allocate resources, inventory, people, money, space, equipment. These are all resources that the organization might need to purchase. How do we use them? What do we need? How many of each do we need? And needless to say, a business plan, a well-written business plan, is a very strong attraction for investors. It's going to be very difficult to get an investor for your business if you have nothing to show them in terms of, this is the plan that I have made that I would like to follow. So securing investment is a very, very powerful rationale for a business plan. If you had to go to any bank, just sit down in front of the manager and say, listen, I, I need a 50,000 euro loan for a new business idea I have. Can you kindly give it to me? Well, what do you think the answer is going to be? Show us your plan. Without that, you're obviously not going anywhere. Now, of course, there are many ways to raise money. So it could be a commercial loan. It could be through angel investors. It could be venture capital funding. Yes, you need to be a good communicator. Yes, you need to be able to talk to these people, to convince them that you know what you're talking about. But it takes a little bit more than just being a good communicator. They'll enjoy listening to you, but at the end, they're going to tell you, can we see your plan? Let's see how realistic it is or how much you are really stretching your imagination, basically. Because, of course, any investor wants to manage their risk as well. Eh? So investors definitely want a plan. They will focus on the financial aspects, without a doubt. In one of the last business plans I wrote for a client of mine who was applying for a hundred thousand euro bank loan, well, the bank came back to me with the, on the financials with very, very specific questions on certain parts and actually asked us to make some revisions which they thought could be a bit, you know, more realistic in their opinion. Well, we did them and we still wanted to see the level of profitability that would be left. But, you know, you kind of realize, oh, they actually see these things, you know. There is somebody entrusted to look into the detail. But, of course, investors want to analyze something else apart from the financials. Do you know your business? Do you know your industry? Do you really have a viable product? Can you really convince that you have something with a competitive edge that you can actually achieve this competitive advantage in the marketplace? And your plan needs to be very, very clear on all these points as to how you are going to achieve it. Eh? So what is very important? I know we use the word plan. But sometimes many people think, oh, now there's a plan. We have to follow the part. And, you know, we can't get off this part kind of thing because that's the plan we developed. Well, let's be realistic, isn't it? Things happen along the path. Time passes. Competitors are doing other things. Governments might legislate. 
things could change in the world economic political situation. What do you do? If they need be, you need to make adjustments to that original business plan that you developed. And that is why the importance today is about the process of planning. How do we recognize that something is happening in the world which could influence our plan, telling us change something? If we are aware of these things, we can keep fine tuning our business plan as we move along. It's a benchmark to which we are comparing our results and reality. Hence, again, the assumptions maybe that we made, which could be being tested. Eh? But having a strategic focus, a strategic mindset is critical and is a clear demonstration through a business plan that you as the entrepreneur have taught out your business strategically. You are making decisions. You are going to put those decisions into action because you are now going to implement the plan. And it's going to have an impact on the long-term performance of your organization. So writing the plan is the starting point. It's definitely not the end point because I do have to emphasize that there is a big gap, a big difference between writing a plan and implementing the plan. That's then the real world. But the more realistic your plan is, the higher the probability you will be able to implement it as close as possible to the plan that you developed. So let's look at three key parts of what constitute a good business plan. Let's begin with the business concept. What do you want to do? The business idea. Because obviously, if you don't have a good business idea, it's going to be very difficult to be successful in a market. How did you get the idea for your business? Is it just your lifelong dream? Is it based on reality? Is it based on observation? Have you observed a gap in the market? Have you observed customers complaining in a particular industry because they are not being served in this way or that way? Have you experienced or found out that there's a product that is missing in a particular category within a business sector that you have obviously some knowledge in? Because unless your business idea is going to fulfill a need, a gap, it's going to be very difficult to take off. Now, there are very, very few exceptions in the world where the level of creativity is so innovative that it's not really filling a gap. It's not really filling a known need. No, it is a game changer. It is something so innovative that nobody knew could actually exist. There are very few of those kinds of businesses. So be careful. My advice for the average business idea you have, make sure you can identify a market gap, a need that customers will be interested in looking at what you have. Know the industry. There are maybe other players around, know what they're doing, have an idea of the competitive environment, see how the industry works, what are the inputs, what are the processes, what are the outputs, the dynamics in the industry, the volatility, the stability in that particular industry. Then develop your business model. Now, of course, developing business models can be, you know, three steps forward, one backwards. You will iterate your business model as you learn more along the way. But maybe using some form of a business model canvas as a sketch, as an idea, which you can then develop is, of course, going to be fundamental. Designing your product or service, how does it work? 
What is the product? Is it going to be one size? Do you have multiple sizes? Is it going to be a particular color? Multiple colors. What is the product? Is it a food product? Is it a spare part? What is the product you are doing? And even services need to be designed. But of course, you don't have a drawing of a, of a service the way you have of a product. But you definitely need to design what we call the service scape. How does a customer interact to get the service experience that we are offering? And therefore, your plan, your business idea needs to communicate how you intend being successful in the market. The second part of the business plan is the marketplace. As I told you earlier on, critical section. Who could be a potential customer? Where are they? What segment do they fit in? How are we going to capture them? Why would they purchase? What motivates the customer to purchase? Now here again, are you in a B2B or are you in a B2C environment? The B2B is going to be more rational. The B2C could be more emotional for all we know. So know what you are dealing with. Know the competitors by name. Find out what you can about them. How do you position yourself now within the market sphere? Do you want to be like high value, high quality, high price? Are you going for low price, medium, average quality? What is the gap that you want to fulfill? Who are the customer segments you are going to attract to your business? Needless to say, all this requires research. You don't just dream this up, do you? The third most important section is your financial, financial section. There are some basics that you want to have in your finances. We say today a three-year projection is probably enough. If you're going to do a seven-year or a 10-year projection, if you're a normal company, that doesn't make sense. You have to be in an extremely stable environment or where projects are very long, maybe in the oil and gas industry, where you can afford very long projections. But in the average environment, three years is probably more than you can anticipate in terms of what's going to happen in the future. And some of the basic financials have to be there. Your income statement, cash flow, balance sheet, break even, net present value, financial ratios, not necessary, but helpful if they could be there, but also very important sources and uses of funds. Where is money coming from to even start your business? The more realistic you are, the better. It's very easy to put numbers in a spreadsheet. The question is, are they meaningful? Is this in line with what you discovered about the market? I love saying this because it is so true. You have to have three best friends when you are starting up a business. Now, unless you are, of course, extremely knowledgeable about business yourself already, you will need a business consultant. Sometimes you need that voice. You need to hear that feedback, that advice. You need a legal advisor. There are contracts to be drawn up. You need to sign contracts. You need to make sure that what you do is legit. You're not breaking any laws for that matter. And of course, if you're going to have a hard time creating the financial projections, maybe you are not an accountant or financial person yourself, then that's where your accountant comes in very, very handy to assist and help you develop the financial statements. These are important points because I have seen many companies make big mistakes when they ignored them completely. And of course, Sometimes it's hard to say, I have competence in everything. Then you ignore something, and then, of course, it's too late as you move down the business, and then something comes back 
to knock you down. We want a summary in our business plan, not too long, one page, one and a half page, not too long, although there are many questions here, but you really want to attract an investor on reading your summary. What's your vision for the future? Quick about something about the business you are in, something that makes you unique. Very, very quickly up to how you're going to fund the business. What kind of investment you are looking for. So make it clear. If you are setting out to attract an investor for your business, make them know that that is what you want to do as early as possible. Say something about your business. Well, are you going to be a sole proprietorship? Is it a partnership? Is it a limited liability company? Are you going to set up a board of directors? Is it already set up? Is it still on the drawing board? So where are you? What are your goals? What competencies do you bring to the table? And very often, the business owner, the founding member, would need to attach a CV in the appendix. So you want to develop some software company, but you have no knowledge, no background about technology. Well, that seems strange, isn't it? How is this person going to start a business in an area that at least from a CV it shows that they know nothing about? Could that be high risk? Why would an investor be interested to support that person? So you need to say something about the business description. As we said already, your industry. What do you know? And here's research. Eh? These are not numbers that are easy to come across. But how big is the industry? Do we know what the total revenue, total sales, total number of firms are? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? Is it stable? How many people does it employ? Is it employing less people over time? Is technology replacing labor? Or is the labor force increasing? What influences the industry? Why would it grow? Why would it decline? So you need to look back five years, at least five years, to be able to understand trends and maybe project those trends with reasonable assumptions. Where is the industry going? And of course, those of you with an academic background, you might want to look at concepts like a Porter's Five Force model to see if there are barriers to entry, if regulations can hinder new entrants, the competitive environment, the substitutes and bargaining power of buyers and suppliers as well for that matter. You need to have a section called competition analysis. Convince the reader you know who you are up against. You know the strengths of your competitors. You know the weaknesses of your competitors. And that way, you might even be able to clearly identify and demonstrate the gap, the need, this is what I'm going to do because no one else is doing it. But make it clear that you understand the market well. So that whatever you say about customers or when you come to project your revenues, they are, of course, realistic and making sense for that matter. But then we come to the sub plans. Now, Everything we said till now is very, very much what we say at a strategic level. The industry, the competition, your board of directors, the company structure, this is all, all up there. Now the detail. Now the detail. How is your business actually going to work? How do you decide if you need to employ five people or 10 people in year one? How do you know what output you can generate? Can you serve 10 customers a day? Can you serve 50 customers a day, 100 customers a day? Do you need to buy one machine, two machines? 
Do you need a one room office? Do you need five rooms in your premises? Do you need a factory floor? Do you need a warehouse? What do you need? And all these become operations decisions. Now the technology plan, now if all you're going to do is have a few laptops that people need to key in, send email from, very, very basic kind of technology, then embed the technology plan as part of the operations plan. But maybe technology is going to be so unique, so special, you might want to have a separate technology plan. So again, it's all going to be a function of what business you are actually working in. But be very, very clear in terms of your inputs, your process, your output, because this links to capacity management issues. And if you don't explore the realities of capacity management, well, you could be dreaming as to how many customers you're going to sell to in a week. Because then you find out operationally you can't do it. You can, of course, include more aspects, all the admin, all the policies, procedures, quality structures, who knows what. But of course, we all know entrepreneurs at startup phase want to minimize the bureaucracy eh? where procedures and admin are concerned. And I can understand that. And it definitely makes a lot of sense to keep your business flexible and lean for that matter. Of course, there are mistakes that are made in an operations plan. When you start the business, you don't keep records, you don't control inventory. As I said, you don't measure capacity. Absolutely not one policy or procedure. So everyone's doing things the way they want. No security system. Well, we could have a whole session discussing the issues of trade secrets, intellectual property, contingency plans. Well, if this doesn't work, what can we do? If we're blocked, if a supplier can't supply us this year, where do we go? Do you have a backup plan? So these are all things that, of course, you need to know. People, who's your management team? Who's on your board? Who are you going to employ? What skills do you need? Why, how are you gonna train them? Roles, responsibilities. Now, at a startup level, this can be pretty simple because you're not employing a hundred people from day one. So the human resource plan for a startup company very often is not the most complex thing you will engage in because as a startup, high probability, you're gonna start with a few people, two, three, five people, literally on day one. So the level of planning for five people is not gonna be as complicated as when growth hits in the organization. There are still problems and mistakes. You know, you just hire your friends because he's a nice guy, but not for the competence. Bad employment contracts, you're not really sure what qualifications you need, but they're ready to accept a low wage kind of thing. You want to maybe share ownership to get the right people in. Be careful. Make sure you know what you are doing in that respect. And my advice is always bring in at least one external director. Get that objective opinion in your business. And of course, if you have a management team, make sure as a team, they know their roles and responsibilities to avoid as much overlap as possible. You don't want to be too rigid in a startup company. Okay, you don't want to have a 20 page job description kind of thing. No, you just want four or five bullet points. These are your key duties. And that's about it, you know, in a startup company. Detail can come later. Marketing plan, as we said, very, very important. There's a bit of an overlap with some things we said about the industry. So be clear about the segment. Possibly from your business model canvas, you've identified the value proposition. 
If there is no value, people will not pay. They will not buy whatever it is you want to sell. So marketing needs to examine customers. How do you retain a customer? How do you kind of build loyalty? How do you advertise? How do you target your advertising? What price do you charge? Maybe if you charge too low, people will assume it's poor quality. Maybe you should charge a high price and people see value in that. Are you going to build a brand image? How are you going to plan that? How are you going to do that? Who is going to be responsible for your marketing? What are you going to do in-house? And maybe what are you going to outsource for that matter? What do competitors do in terms of marketing? What is their brand image? How do they advertise? How do they promote? Where are they located? What's working for the competition? And what do you know they tried and failed and lost money in? So, of course, you don't repeat the same mistakes. Eh? So these are all things one needs to research and study to find out. These things don't come obvious, you know. You don't just sit down at your desk on your own and come up with all these decisions. You have to be out there. So market research is imperative, I'm telling you. You need to research the markets. You need to research your potential customers. And ultimately, did you find potential customers? And never forget, there is a big difference between what people say they will do and what they will actually do. Yes, we'll buy your product when you launch it. Yes, we'll participate in that service when you launch it. You launch, and where are the customers? So that's something you need to be very, very careful about. Look at your four Ps, look at your seven Ps, and work on them. Make sure, as a marketing plan, you have some good ideas to know how to tap into the market out there. So a lot of decisions need to be made about the product, price, distribution, promotion, which at least will cover the basic four Ps. In services, we very often tell people, well, you can go into people, process, and physical evidence as well. And that opens it up to seven Ps. But these are all the result of research. Bad research, bad marketing concepts. Good research, higher probability you found your niche. You found the right target market. You really establish that people want to purchase in this way and not another way. Yes, all this can cost you money. There is money to be spent in developing a good business plan that is based on research. But I think it's better to invest a few thousand euros in research and know where you stand than start a business risking a hundred thousand and end up failing. Eh? But that's a decision that, of course, you have to make as an entrepreneur. And that says something about your risk, your personal risk profile, eh? how risk averse or how risk taking you are as an individual. So we will see differences between various entrepreneurs there. Some common mistakes, obviously. Oh, there's no one doing what we do. We're going to be the first. There's no one else. You overestimate or underestimate competitor strengths. Very often, they are underestimated. You have no strategy on how you counter competition. You have no idea what to do if they launch a new product. And then, of course, you just out of nowhere decide you're going to capture 20% market share. You know, just like that. Pricing is not in line with realities. Too low or too high. Or maybe you're targeting a certain price to the wrong sector. So you misjudged the sector. 
you misjudge the real marketing cost. I have seen some business plans with extremely low marketing expenditure, and yet they think they're going to attract a hundred or a thousand customers on day one. No, they won't. You will be amazed how expensive things are in marketing. And of course, no logic in pricing strategy. You haven't tested it. You haven't really analyzed the price to value ratio you have there. Or you just work on the cost plus model. It's going to cost me X. I want 10% margin. So, you know, add 10% to my cost and that's my pricing. Price sensitivity is a very good exercise. If I increase my costs by 5%, what happens to my sales? I had a customer once that increased their price literally by 5%. Within three months, they lost 25% of their sales. Needless to say, they had to revert back to the original pricing strategy they, they had. So that's the concept of price sensitivity. A small increase in price might mean a very big loss of customers. And sometimes a reduction of 5% could mean an increase of 25% in your revenue. So again, this is the knowledge you need to have of the industry that you are trying to participate in. Well, I'm not going to teach you finance because we covered the main points that need to go in the financial plan. But I will definitely warn you about some of the most common mistakes we see in financial planning. Unrealistic sales. There we go. 20% market share. Profit projections. Why? Because costs are very low. Price is very high. And, you know, you're going to make a lot of money in no time at all. So you don't really understand the costs within the industry. The wages you are paying people, totally out of line with reality. We've seen business plans where employers were going to employ people below minimum wage, where in a country there is a minimum wage level. So it means they didn't even study that, you know? You don't project. Downside, what if your sales forecast is unmet? What happens? How much can you afford to lose? And sometimes, yes, mathematical errors in spreadsheets, in the composition of the financial plan itself. Figures are inconsistent. You're showing an increase in sales or you're showing growth by year three. But guess what? Your marketing costs stay the same. Your employment costs stay the same. Nothing changes, but revenue increases. Oh, how nice that you didn't need to spend one extra euro to make, you know, a few extra hundred thousand in revenue. That means you are not being realistic. No control over receivables to make sure people pay you. And of course, no control of cash flow. In other words, the cash flow statement leaves much to be desired. And that is a big problem for all startup companies. A growth plan is nice because it shows that you're thinking ahead. You have a vision. Now, you might start with one particular product. You might start with one particular service. Where's it going? Maybe you have a plan that, listen, by mid-year three or by year four, we are going to expand and launch this new product or this ancillary service. Or we're going to start looking into the export market. We want to grow. Internationalization is on the table. Well, some companies can, in, can internationalize very, very fast especially if they are technology-based. But of course, if you are dealing in brick and mortar kind of companies, internationalization could take a little bit longer. Capital requirements can grow. And personnel requirements, you might need new skills. You might need to pay people better. So have a good concept 
of your growth plan. And again, many mistakes happen there. There's no prioritization. Everyone wants to do everything at the same time. Again, overestimating revenues for new products or services. In other words, you know, unrealistic assumptions. You don't have the right management team. You want to internationalize. None of your team have international business experience. Well, that's quite risky. And of course, you fail to identify added capital costs you are going to incur as you move forward. The risks. You need to know the risks you are undertaking. Competitive risks, management issues. What if a key manager leaves? Legal issues, staff issues. What if you are depending on someone? What are the business internal risks you are facing? Keep track of them to ensure you have mitigating efforts to combat those risks. And at the end, evaluate your business plan. Do I have the right concept? Are they, is my idea really unique? Did I really identify the customers who benefits at the end of what I'm doing? Can I really enter this venture? Do I have the means to generate the money? Where is it coming from? Did I price my product or service as well? Am I getting the right people on board? So these are all important questions you need to ask. So I'll end on this note. Focus your energy. You can't do everything. But writing a business plan sets that vision. You know what to focus on. And if you are focused, you are not going to let things distract you. Work on the roadmap. Yes, you might need to fine-tune it, David, alter it. New things will happen. Do so. But then, as I said earlier on, one of your key challenges is taking a well-crafted plan into reality. And that, of course, is a very, very challenging exercise for all entrepreneurs engaging in a startup phase. And with this, I end what I wanted to share with you today. You can always contact me if you need anything further beyond what I've covered with you today. And, you know, at this stage, I think we can open what we call the Q, the Q&A, the Q&A session. So I'm going to just start reading from, from the top. And I'm going to see how many of these questions we can, we can answer this. How to devise a business model? Well, I think I said something earlier, earlier on. There are concepts known as business model canvases. That gives you a very, very good guide. There are nine dimensions in it. In a way, you're looking at the internal side. You're looking at the customer side. You're looking at the value. You're looking at the finance. In a quick answer I can give you, that's the first point I would say look at because it is definitely necessary to have a business model. Of course, there's more that can be said, but of course, time is limited in the way we answer. So look at the concept of a business model canvas. It will definitely help you. Second question I have, is it necessary to state the history in the executive summary? And it's only, no, there's no need to do that because you might say, well, what is my history at the end of the day? I'm just starting off. You know, I just registered a company last week. There's nothing I can say. Well, so say that. Say that the company is starting from scratch. There is no historical background to this idea because maybe, maybe you started the business six months ago. And you're only writing the business plan now. So maybe there is a history. But if there isn't, fine. And that's the whole idea of a startup organization, eh? You know? So that is easy to do. How can I get the username and password of my site in order to access reading materials? Well, I'm not sure how to answer a question like that. 
Um, I don't know how to answer you because I'm not sure what my site is for that matter. Maybe the admin can give you an answer in, in that respect. How can you gain information about marketplace? In Let's see if I'm answering the right question. I don't want to miss anything. Yeah, how can you gain information about marketplace in practice? For example, I think I spotted a gap in the market, a kind of service which could be demanded, but it's some till not quite little offered. Okay, first of all, as we said, look at what the competition is offering. See what they are doing. See where their weaknesses are. Talk to people. That's how you gain market information. Try and maybe through interviews, through questionnaires. This is the whole idea of market research, isn't it? Through questionnaires, through interviews, you're talking to people to find out what are they missing? Or you throw an idea. Wouldn't it be nice if someone came up with this idea? What do you think of something like this? See what people feel. That's how you start looking at things. But undertaking structured market research will help you understand that. That's how you spot the gap. Of course, you need to have the creative mind as well. Huh? Because no one is going to knock on your door and tell you, hey, there's a gap in the market. Do you want to fill it? You have to be capable of seeing what other people don't see. Huh? So that's the way, that is the way to do it. So if you think you spotted a gap, test it. Get a feel. Ask people. Ask people. That's the way you find out. At least you get a feeling. Next one, thank you. Thank you very much for that compliment. I would like to know more strategies to set up a business in a risky environment due to wars or severe depression due to insecurities. Well, if you are starting a business in a war zone, let's say, um, you know, the concept of doing a three-year business plan might already be stretching it. Huh? It's very, very risky. And I don't think that a business plan in that environment is going to help you. Is going to help you. Too much instability, even a three-year plan, becomes too unpredictable. And if you are looking for an investor, well, does an investor want to invest in a high-risk environment? If you do find an investor who wants to, then have no doubt they want to pull out early with a very high return. With a very high return. So that is not going to be easy. You use three, you know, very tough words here. Wars, severe depression, insecurities, you know. But then again, it's amazing, you know. You know, in a war, well, there are needs, eh? Maybe, maybe you can have a business where you are making uniforms for soldiers, for all I know. Maybe you can be providing food. Maybe you can be providing shelter. So the reality is every situation creates an opportunity, insecurities, danger maybe. Well, a security firm makes a boom in a highly insecure area, high risk. But they boom. So sometimes the kind of business idea you're looking for needs to be appropriate for the particular environment you are talking. So very difficult to plan ahead, though, in those three environments. Probably a lean startup approach would probably make more sense than a structured business plan. A structured business plan requires an element of stability. Not 100%, but 80%, 70% stability in the industry. Not 10% or 20% stability. Then the business plan falls apart very, very fast. This is a Manuel from Uganda. Which procedure do I use to determine whether my business will have potential customers. 
market research is the only way you can do that, or you have to test the market with what we call a minimum viable product or a minimum viable service. You develop something quick and dirty, so to speak, and test it in the market. Yeah, it might not be perfect yet, but see the reaction. See the reaction. Listen, there is always going to be a risk unless customers sign up and pay you in advance for whatever you're going to do. You have no guarantee, no guarantee that you will have customers. But testing the market reduces the risk. As I said earlier, potential customers will tell you, I will buy, and then they don't. But come on, not everyone is going to do that. Some will believe in your product or in your service, but test it. I had a client once, he spent a whole year developing an app which he was sure the market is going to jump on and it's an excellent portal. He had the pricing ready and everything. And I asked him, have you tested this with customers? Have you gone to any... This was a re, this was meant for retail. Have you gone to any of the key retail outlets to talk to them if your idea works for them? And I made him go and speak to 10 companies. Not one of them was interested in his idea. Not one of them was ready to pay the price he wanted. What was his problem? He developed his business idea secretly for a whole year without doing any market research. He just had the idea, it's a good idea. And that's not the way to do business. Test with a minimum viable product. Yes, you spend money. Yes, you take a risk. But if you're not a risk taker, then you're not going to be an entrepreneur. So that's the way to do it. How to be sure about the idea? I'm sorry, you cannot be sure. You can only talk in terms of probabilities of success. There is a high probability that the idea will work because I studied the market. I studied the industry. I studied the competition. I surveyed potential customers. That's all you can do. You, If you're looking for a 100% guarantee of an idea, then it's you're going to be too risk averse. Is it innovative or not? Well, is it innovative or not? You should know, because you should know what exists out there or not. If you studied the market, you should not. Some ideas can raise and soon fail because of the weaknesses of the demand, for example. Yes, and you know, not to depress any of you, but the, but the failure rate of startups is much higher than the success rate. We know that. That we know that, that is the way it is. But always remember, the entrepreneur always believes that he or she has a business idea that will be in the success percentage. So there are many reasons why businesses fail. When I teach entrepreneurship, I think in my course, I've got about 10 slides that go over reasons for failure. Could be many things. You don't understand the market. You didn't have a unique product. You didn't understand finance. You didn't put in enough time. You didn't invest properly. You set up in the wrong location. Who knows? Who knows? It could be one of those reasons. It could be multiple reasons. So learn the industry. Learn the industry to ensure you don't fall into the pitfalls there. Is there a formula, I'm moving on, to predict the number of potential customers for a new product? Very, very difficult, especially if it is an innovative new product. There are some formulas in some specific industries. I remember having two students who did a thesis uh, on a 
completely new product their company developed. One was in the pharmaceutical industry. One was in the oil and gas industry. Oh, and I can tell you, they struggled huh, to come up with some kind of formula to look at potentials for a completely new product. In other words, the market doesn't have this. So it's not a case of let's see what the competition does. It's not a case of to see how many were sold by others before. Not easy. It's high risk. It's high risk. So there isn't, I'll tell you one thing, there is no formula that is used as a standard for any product or any service in any industry. No. Some industries don't have. And of course, therefore, then it's a matter of market research to try and test. To try and test either with a real idea or at least conceptually if people are ready to go for something in that respect. How to find and minimize the expected risk? Well, you should be able to identify certain risks, but then again, um, your three best friends can enlighten you to that. Your accountant can enlighten you on certain financial risks. If your revenue falls beyond this, if you don't sell so much by a particular date, your lawyer, can tell you there could be legal risks you are taking. Risk maybe you don't want to register for intellectual property. Well, you risk that someone copies you, for example. So these become a problem. Now, minimizing risk is what we call a mitigation plan. So you need to develop a mitigation plan. Now, of course, there's no standard there. In other words, depending on the particular risk, the particular business and sector you are in, if you've identified a risk, you need to ask yourself, okay, what can I do to minimize that? That's what you have to say. Okay, maybe I can minimize that by selling in two locations. Maybe I can minimize that by employing a second person. Maybe I can minimize that risk by outsourcing a certain percentage and not keeping everything in-house. I don't know. It depends what risk you identify. But there is always some aspect within which you can mitigate a risk. How can we assure a bulletproof market research? No. There are no such things as bulletproof market research. Needless to say, the more you spend, the more data you collect, the more information you have, in a way, the more reliable your data analysis is. But there is a risk in doing that. How much are you willing to spend on market research? How much time are you ready to dedicate? Let me give you a quick thing that someone did once. There was a time in my country, in Malta, the taxi service was a very closed industry. The government was going to liberalize the industry. Somebody wanted to open a company for taxis. What did this person do? He stopped using his car. Everywhere he went, he went by taxi. He would spend nights and evenings going to the hotspots in the tourist destinations to see where people use taxis, counting them, seeing how often taxis come observing when he's in a taxi, giving very difficult addresses to the taxi driver to see if they know the way, to see if they find the address, looking at the condition of the vehicle, sitting outside the offices of the key taxi companies to see how many phone calls they are taking, to see how many people walk in, how many taxis go out. And he spent a few months doing personal market research apart from hiring a market research company. So he was living the market research in a way and was identifying the weaknesses in the industry. But a bulletproof approach, no. Ladies and gentlemen, in the real business world, there are no guarantees. There are only probabilities. I once had a client that wanted me to guarantee that if they follow my recommendations, 
they will make a certain amount of revenue. And I told them, I'm very sorry, I can't give you the guarantee. I can only talk in terms of probabilities. Because you cannot control everything in the real world. In fact, you realize there's very little you can control. More elaboration on channel variety. But again, it depends what you have. Whether it is a physical product, whether you're going to sell it from your store, whether you're going to make an online and delivery service, whether you're going to distribute, whether you are going to franchise this product, whether you will deliver to people's houses, whether they will come to you, whether it's B2B or whether it's B2C. Maybe you are just an internet-based company and people just, you know, subscribe or get their service online with you. So it really depends what you are, but also how does the industry operate? What are the logistical infrastructures that exist in the particular industry that you are operating? Thanks for facilitating the masterclass. It was mentioned the four P's and seven. Could we please explain which of these P's are you referring to? Well, the four P's, we had them on another slide. On another slide, and you will get the slides, you had the columns, there was price, there was promotion, there was place, <clears throat> and right now, and there was distribution, okay? And then there was people, there was process, and there was physical evidence. So these are the P's we are talking about. They all refer to Kotler's marketing techniques. So do look, look that up. And if you go back a few slides, when you get a copy of the slides, you will definitely find them. What is your recommendation for best practice in finding the correct price for your product or service? Could be two ways about doing this. One, there is obviously an analysis of competitive pricing. Okay, map that out. But of course, price to value price to value, because some could be high value, low value, low end, high end. So look at price, competitive pricing, in terms of positioning. Now, this is knowledge of marketing yeah, here. You have to make that distinction. So that is one thing. And then you say, if I want to position myself in this place, what's happening around me? And maybe because you are new to the market, you will slightly underscore, slightly underscore. There are formulas as well that can be used even in market research to test your price, where you are testing people in terms of ranges. Will you pay between this and this if for this value? Will you pay between this and that range? There are ways to test these things. So there are ways in which you can get an idea. The problem is, of course, if you are completely innovative. As I said at the beginning, very difficult. But if you are completely innovative, then, of course, maybe, um, you know, then you come up with your own idea. I've got a note here. Communications would like to answer this question live. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, Mr. David Ingley. You yes. got a notification, you said? <laughs> yes, it said communications would like to answer this question live. Ah, okay. No, I think that was just referred to the fact that you will be answering the question. Okay. Live. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no problem. This I would also would... just maybe like to mention that uh, unfortunately we're running a bit out of time. Uh, so we have time left for, I think, two more questions to be answered. Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Okay, please would this slide be shared at the end? Yes, you're going to get all, all the slide back. Can one work with you to develop a business plan? That spans more, but then you're going to talk to me personally about something like that, but it's definitely not impossible. What is the best approach towards targeted investors? How do we target them? Well, that's where you're looking at the concept of angel investing, maybe, huh? where you want to target. You're going to look in your country, for example, if the concept of angel investors exists, you have relatively business, wealthy business people 
people with money in their pockets ready to take a little bit of a risk, put in their money to help your business move forward. But you need to see if there are networks of angel investors. And if you don't know this, maybe contact your chamber of commerce and tell them, can you put me in contact with, you know, a number of investors for all, you know, chambers of commerce and these kinds of associations will definitely be able to help you in that respect. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to stop, stop here. It's definitely been a pleasure. I'm sorry I can't answer every question, but there are quite a lot of you online today. A number of questions show the enthusiasm you have had for the, for the topic. All I can tell you is, you know, if it's kind of relevant and you really need to know something, do contact me on the email address you are seeing on the screen. And if I'd be able to help you, I gladly will. So thank you all very much for attending today's seminar. Don't leave yet because uh, Paul, I would like to, of course, conclude and inform you about the future plans for masterclasses. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. David Dingley, for this insightful online masterclass. We received a lot of great comments in the chat, highlighting your detailed and informative session. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, I would also like to mention again that we will share the indeed the recording and the slides with you afterwards um, in a few days. Um, thank you everybody for joining. Um, indeed, we will have uh, next um, our next online masterclass on the 21st of March, uh, which will be provided by uh, Dr. Vincent Feldkamp on the topic of um, the digital economy and the digital transformation of business. Um, keep an eye on our website for um, details and the registration links, which will follow in the coming weeks. Um, yeah, that was it from my side. Thank you again, uh, Mr. David Dingley. Thank you my to pleasure. all the attendees. And um, yeah, hope you have a great day and uh, thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Hmm.